So you want to start using object-oriented programming, but don't know where to start. Well, you came to the right place, because in this video, I'm going to show you how to define how to use classes using Python. <laughs> Let me tell you, I'm super excited about this tutorial, because really, object-oriented programming is one of the paradigms that is super popular and very powerful to use. And this is the first step into getting used and getting to know how, how it works. So get your coffee ready and let's get started. But before doing anything else, we have to define what is a class. A class is the building blocks that leads into object-oriented programming. It is a user-defined data type that holds its own data and functions. All right, very cool. But what is object-oriented programming? I'm so glad you asked. Object-oriented programming, or OPS, it's a programming paradigm that is based on the concept of objects. It organizes software design around data and objects instead of functions and logic. In this paradigm, each object is responsible for its own data and functions. All right, I think that was enough theory for today. Let's get to the fun part. This is a script where we're going to start doing some practices on defining classes and learning how to use them. The first thing that we're going to do is define a class. This is done in Python with the keyword class, followed by the name that you want to give to that class. For this example, we're going to have a class for person. So I'm just going to call it person. Click colon, enter, and that's pretty much it. That's defining a new class. And everything that's inside of this is going to be part of the person class. So let's define a couple of things. We already mentioned that the classes can have different data and functions. So let's do that. So I'm just going to find a new function. It's going to be called uh, say hi. Uh, we have a class and inside of this class, we have one function that is called say hi, and it only prints a message. Hi, the functions inside of the classes or class functions are defined exactly the same way as any other function. You have the def keyword, the name of the function, and you may notice that we have a parameter right here, even though we're not using anything for our print statement. This is because every class function must pass on as a parameter itself. That's why this variable name is usually called self. This is just a convention. You could actually name it whatever, but for the moment, let's just stick to the name self. So let's try this code and take a look at what happens. The only thing that's executing is this print statement. And that is because if we're just defining a class, but we haven't used it. So in order to use a class, we have to assign that to another variable. So in this case, I'm just saying me, and that's going to be a person. So I'm going to be the type person. Very cool, right? At this point, we already created an object, and this is also called instantiating a class. Don't let this complicated word fool you. The only thing it means is that we're assigning some memory to a variable of the type person. But if I run this again, nothing is going to happen because we're just creating the person, but we're not doing anything with it. In order to do that, we can say me dot say hi. Okay. Now if I run this, there's another keyword now. Really cool. Now we have a class. We instantiated that class to create an object, which is stored in the variable me. And we used one of the class functions, but there's still a lot more to cover. So let's go further into it. I want to point you to the line 17 in this code we are creating a new variable of the type person. What's happening underneath the hood is that this is running a specific function and this is called double underscore init double underscore or dunder init. This is the function that I was just talking about. And this function is just created the same way. Just you have to use this name, which is double underscore init double underscore. And that tells Python that this is going to be executed every time one object is created of this class. And this is where it starts to get interesting. If you think about it, a person has different attributes that every single person has. For example, name, age, weight, and many more. So let's add those attributes to our class. Our class is starting to get a little bit bigger. Now, when our class is created, we're going to ask our user to give us a name and a weight for that person. Each one of these lines where you say self is pretty much saying, okay, to the person, create a variable called name and store whatever value the user gave you in this parameter called name. In the second line, we do something similar, but we're creating a variable with a default value, which is going to be zero. With the weight, it's exactly the same as with the name, but we're using a different data type because for the name, we're going to have a string and for the weight, we're going to have a float. So I just wanted to show you that you could do this with any variable type. So we have to do a little change here because now when we create the person, we need to give it a name. So I'm just going to say, you know, Chuck, and uh, you know, Chuck, he's, he's muscular. So he's going to be like around 180. And, and now we're creating a person with a name Chuck an age of zero and a weight of 180. And now we can access those variables. Let's try that. So now we change our function to say hi to include the name. So now the print statement says hi, I'm, and then we're going to call the variable name, which we stored in ourselves. So this is going to get for us the name that we gave at the initialization of our class. Pretty cool, right? But you can also have access from outside of the class. For example, here we're saying hi, and then we're calling for that variable name. 
right? So I'm saying me because that's the name of the variable of the type of person. And we know that every person is going to have a name. So you can access it with the dot and then the variable name, which in this case is name. So if we run this, it's saying this is the main code, which is just a sprint statement. And now it's saying, hi, I'm Chuck because it's using its own name. And then we're answering back saying, hi, Chuck. Okay, so now you learn how to define variables within your class. Let's go a little bit further and modify them. So I added two more functions, the breathe function, which is not doing anything. It's just there for, you know, like a placeholder and you can use the pass keyword if you don't want to do anything with it. And we'll take a look at why we do this, but I just wanted to show that you can have as many functions as you want. Then we have the birthday function. And what this is going to do is going to increase the age of your person. Then it's going to say hi and it's going to print the age. So in our main function, we still have Chuck being instantiated to the, to the variable me. Then we print a couple of his attributes, being that the name and the age right here. Chug is zero years old. He's a quite young. Then we have the function breathe, which doesn't do anything. And then the birthday. So he should increase his age should increase by one. Then he says, hi, hi, I'm Chug. Then we get this line and I am one year old. Then we just check again the variables from outside the, the class itself. And we can see that Chug is one year old. With these couple of functions, now you can see how we can store data within the class itself and how we can access it from outside of it as well. There's a couple other things where you can make these kind of attributes locked so you cannot modify them outside of the function, but that's something for another tutorial. Right now, what I want to show you is something called inheritance. Inheritance is one of the pillars of object-oriented programming. And what this means is that you're creating one class that it's inheriting from another one. And the best way to understand this is with an example. So let's go take a look. So I did two things to our code. We got rid of the breathe function because it was not doing anything. So I replaced it with sleep. It's going to come into play later. But right now, just take a look at that. And we created another class, very similarly to the way we did before with the person class. But now we created one that's called parent. And if you see inside the parentheses, we're giving another class, which is person. This means that the parent is going to inherit from person. The best way to think about this is that every parent is going to be a person, but not every person is going to be a parent. The parent class, it's going to inherit or just have access to all of the things that the person has. But you can also define new things that are going to be specific to the parent classes. Let's take a look at what I'm talking about. Remember our init function for the person class, the function that it's called automatically every time you instantiate an object? Well, we defined one for our parent and it's very simple. We're defining just one attribute, which is the number of kids that this uh, parent is going to have. And we can define it the same way. So let's create one parent. So I'm going to create one that's going to be called mom. And this is going to be a parent. And I'm going to give him the number of kids, which is going to be three because, you know, I have three kids and, you know, I want somebody to feel the same way as I do. <laughs> that was okay. But let's have our mom have a birthday. Mom dot birthday. Oh, birthday. And then let's try to run this. So this created an error and that's something that we expected because if you think about it, the birthday requires the attribute of age. And since we're not running the init function for the person within our parent class, the parent doesn't have any age. So that's what's happening here. Parent doesn't have an attribute called age. And there's a very simple way to fix this. So what we actually want to do in our init method is that first we have to create a person complete. That means call the init function. And then we can add any other things that are specific just for the parent class. And the way we can do this is calling the init method of the parent. And we can do that very simply. We can just call super, which is going to call the parent of the current class, which in this case, whoa, which in this case, it's going to be the person. So what this line is going to do, it's just going to call this and it's going to set up everything we need to create our person object. But this one needs two attributes, the name and the weight. So we're also going to need them in our parent init function. So now I added those. We have the name, the weight and the number of kids. That's going to be specific only for the parents. Remember that. So our person defined here. So Chuck should still be valid. But we need to change this because the parent definition now it's different. So we need a name. I'm just going to call it mom again. The weight is going to be, I don't know, 90. And then we have three kids, right? So now it works perfectly. As you can see, we have the attributes from the base class and we're still calling the birthday method. And this is very powerful because you can see anything that is inherited from that class can still call and access all these variables and functions. 
This is very exciting. I love the inheritance method, but before moving on, I just want to say that you have to be very careful with the object oriented programming and especially with inheritance. Just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should do it every single time. Having a deep inheritance tree can be very confusing and can lead to having your code being very unreadable and very hard to maintain. So just be careful. Usually you don't want to have more than two or maximum three levels of inheritance. But now I want to show you two different things about child classes. So let's define two new functions for our parent class. We got a new function called put kids to bed. Obviously this function is specific to a parent and somebody that doesn't have any kids wouldn't have this responsibility so they shouldn't need this function. That's why it's not available on the person class. Are you starting to get how the responsibilities are encapsulated within each one of these classes? That's very interesting, but I want to point your attention to this one right here. We have a sleep function and you might be thinking like, Danny, sleep is not a function that's specific to parents. And you are totally right. That's why we have one function for the person. Every single person can sleep. That's why we have it here. But if you're a parent, you might know that you never sleep. Take a look at this line. The parent class called mom is calling the birthday function, which is from the person. And this is being executed and that's totally fine. But if we call the sleep function like this, what do you think is going to happen? So right now it's saying, mom, you know that parents don't sleep. And that's true. But wait. Our, our, our sleep function doesn't do anything. Why is that happening? That is because we're overriding the function within our parent class. If you take a look here, it's saying I'm defining a sleep function and this is what I want it to do. So the way this works is that when the object gets a function, it's going to check first if the function is defined within that same object. If it is, then it's going to execute that. If it's not, it's going to check within the parent. This concept is called overriding functions, and it's very powerful in order to be specific about the functions that you want every single class to do. All right, so we learned about classes, how to define them, how to use them. And the easiest way to remember this is that a class definition is just like a blueprint. It doesn't create anything. It just creates a formula of how that object is going to create it later. So in this case, when we created Chuck in line 43, it's just following the formula here and then that is called instantiating and creating an object. And you can create as many objects as you want of the same class. For example, here, we created another person called Linus. He's stored in the variable friend. Then we're calling his birthday. As you can see here, I already ran this code. And you can see that first Chuck has his birthday. So he's now one year old. That's from the line 46. After that, we created Linus and he had a birthday. So now he's saying, hi, I'm Linus. And he's one year old as well. Then Chuck had a birthday again. So now he's, hi, I'm Chuck. He's now two years old. And what I want to show you here is that each one of these objects has its attributes locked within itself. So if Chuck has a birthday, his age is going to change, but Linus' age is going to remain the same, unaffected. So at the end here, we're printing both of these person's attributes. And as you can see, Chuck is two years old, but Linus is one year old because each one of these has control of its own data. That's very important. This is part of the encapsulation of data and methods that we talked before. Classes are very useful. It can allow you to compartmentalize your code and have it easier to read and to understand. But it can also be a two-edged sword. It can turn your code into something very difficult to understand as well. So be careful when you use this. Very exciting, right? Now you can start defining and using classes within your code in Python. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something from it. If you did, remember to give it a like, subscribe to the channel if you haven't. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. The coffee's over, so I guess the video is over too.